Welcome. Are we on? Are you seeing this? Are we in the interweb? Tell who we are. This is the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. I'm Bruce D. Mitchell, and today we've got three hours of review. So uh, what I wanted to do was keep it all mask related. Let me uh, stop endorsing Starbucks. Uh, I'm going to endorse Starbucks. <laughs> anyway, but uh, we do. We pay a lot for that crap. Uh, these are the masks I've brought today. I brought various forms. They each do a different thing. This is the one that the video lesson, this is what we ended up with. You can see I got a little wear and tear on it. We'll talk about how to fix that if you need to. This is something new I've been working on. Uh, I just started this last week. It's a much more symmetrical, smooth piece. I've also got another one in the trunk that's more together and it's, uh, it's a little more free. So, uh, hold on, are we having technical difficulties? All right, helmet, you end up with a nice base. Uh, then I wanted to add something to give it a little more character. I've got a mouthpiece, you know, the ha-ha, it's the mouthpiece. It's a, it's a boom mic, but I wanted it to look toothy. I wanted the, the venting to be there. Just a lot of character. Really draws attention to itself. Crowns the mouth. And then also there was sort of the, the night vision goggle assembly. These, these are things that always kind of fascinate me. Uh, about about modern military gear, just the fact that we have night vision and, and uh, other capabilities that we throw over our eyes, but this just flips up just like so. Um, let's talk about this hinge here real quick. This is a cabinetry hinge. This is called an invisible hinge. An invisible hinge is just a really fancy hinge, uh, and I like the way that uh, the rest of the kind of trimming here I use a lot of uh, brake cable housing, but before I use that, I just took, this is just copper or brass wire that I took a small rod and I just wound it around, wound it up. Uh, I like to make, well, anytime I have a piece that goes to something, I do like to suggest that there's, a, there's an electrical apparatus that connects to that piece. I don't like free floating, this is before Wi-Fi, I don't know, maybe you could have your Wi-Fi magical uh, techno bits talk to each other now but before I like tubes I like tubes for the drama I like tubes for the direction of the eye a lot of my favorite sci-fi fantasy artists include this kind of stuff in their work whether it sweeps off the head the neck to the arms you know somebody's uh, somebody's weapon will have a tube going to a power pack I think these are great not just for the technical imaginative aspect but also when it comes to either drawing lines or, or illustrating a direction whether in sculpture or in uh, 2D work. It's nice to use tubes and lines to kind of direct the eye. So again, take a look at all this. This is all built up one note at a time. I just started and I'd, uh, it is the second best Star Trek movie next to Wrath of Khan. It's a Galaxy Quest and uh, the bad guy Ceres, the, he is the coolest character. It was one of my absolute favorites and I love that kind of that over-the-top, big, I mean, his, his shoulder pads breathe. He had articulated tentacles on his head or spider leg sort of bits. I don't know what you call those. I'm not sure what they were, but they were awesome, and it sold the image. But um, I hated his henchmen. His henchmen had these, like, turtle hats on, and I thought it would have been much cooler to have something, something like this over there, their lizard-like faces. Um, and that's a lot of times the genesis of where I start to get to the, the more fun stuff, the goggles, the face masks, all that. So I, think I would encourage you to, to start with something that's already existing and then give it its own uh, wild new skin. I'll put this one away here. Okay, this guy, we've seen this guy before. He's all over my uh, Facebook pages, my blogs. He's, uh, he's one of my newer pieces, my, one of my newer complete pieces. I call him Dread Tenna. I, it, it, I don't know. Dread Tenna, why not? I haven't heard that name before, but, you know, he had these dread -like, dreadlock like antennas. And everybody, you know, oh, that reminds me of Predator. Sure it does. Look at more sci-fi fantasy art. You'll see more guys have like tentacle-like things on their head. Uh, I'm not knocking the Predators, but not everything's Predator. I worked on Predator. I've worked on two Predator movies. Not everything's Predator. Alright? 
appreciate it. I know you're just looking for something to compare it to, but uh, again, let's say you start out with a face like this. This started out as a face like this. But uh, once you build a face like that, you get to add bits like this. I don't have leather cross ties here. It's not just decoration, that's an actual stitch. And also at the edge here, I don't know how close you can get on that. All right. Let me pull out a pointer. You close? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've got here, I've got, it's basically like leather, it's a gasket, but what it's doing is keeping, the, you know, you can see how this moves a little bit. These pieces are actually all separate. Everything in here is a separate piece, and that stitch isn't just for looks, it's a practical stitch. It, this is the kind of thing that allows it to fit on various head shapes, and like if you look at if you look at people in your world, or if you, uh, I'm just going to look around in the crowd here, everybody's a unique, magical, individual snowflake, and especially when it comes to the shape of your head. I've got a rather skinny, genie-like bean, so my head shape isn't going to fit his head shape. Something more broad. I'm sure he's got a bigger brain. So, uh, whatever. Head shapes are unique, and you want to make sure that it, one mask doesn't fit just one person. It's very, you know, it's intimidating. It's why the police wear mirrored sunglasses. Uh, it's a great way to go about presenting yourself as a character and not allowing people to see who you actually are. When we get into masks, we're dealing with personification, and we don't always want to see or let people see who we are. So, it's all about disguising it. And that's what I found with the sunglass lenses. And from then on, that's the, pretty much every pair has it. I think there's, there's one item I'm working on that won't have it. It's a more classical looking piece, so I don't want to put lenses in it. You know, whenever you do put lenses in it, you, you can't have something. It's medieval. It's got sunglass lenses. So I'm keeping them out of the, this next piece I'm working on. But uh, it is an awesome way to just trip people out more with your awesome costume. They can't see who you are, don't let them. Okay. Thanks guys. So this, uh, I brought this one. This one is not made of an epoxy clay. This one, when I first started it, it was all made out of styrene. I glued it together. I had an idea of what I wanted to do with the face, but I had to make the face, construct it around the eyes first, and then sort of bridge it out and around and discover just sort of angles. As I'd glue a piece, I'd make sure it fit. I did work with a life cast to make sure this would fit over a face. But again, uh, this one being uh, so fragile, it was one that I went and, and I actually hired one of the guys at, at Legacy Effects to make a mold for me. Uh, Javier Contreras, uh, great mold maker, and I just I had him do it because I wanted to move on to the next one, and it was sort of a barter trade, pay a little, but if I could get somebody else to make the mold, that's not my big bag of fun, so I'll, I'll trade or, or do that kind of stuff instead. But uh, yeah, I had to make a mold of this. It was so fragile, it would not survive. So this is a casting, and this is actually a uh, fiberglass Bondo I think there's, there's a mud layer in there, and then it's got just two layers of glass. So it's not real heavy, it's pretty good. And uh, the lenses, let me tell you about these lenses. So I'm a, I'm a sunglass dork, I mean obviously I put lenses and everything. I really like Oakley's. So I called Oakley, and uh, I didn't call them, I, I inched some of the masks, but I had never seen the variety that uh, are in the uh, Commedia dell'arte. And then the versions or styles or eras that people have done and went and embellished this. So uh, I wanted to make my own. I'd love to do a series of that. I'd love to someday have an art show in Venice. That would be just incredible. It's the land of masks and glass, you know. You got the island of Murano that's making the uh, beautiful glass pieces. And then, you know, I, I'm not sure where the masks come from. I saw some people making them, but the, the tradition is rich. It's beautiful and it's open to interpretation. So I wanted to do that. Uh, so yeah, I call it Dr. Bird. Because uh, I've got kids and they come in the garage every now and then and they're all, they're, they're giving me compliments and my kids are like, nice. You know, they're four and a half and two and a half and they, they were just convinced I was making a bird mask. 
And um, I said, no, it's a, it's a plague doctor. And, but you know, how much do you describe a plague to a four-year-old before they just don't get it at all? So I think he retained doctor. And then he came back the, the next day to give me a compliment, check out my progress, hang out in the garage a little bit. And he goes, hey, Dad, I really like your Dr. Bird. So since then, I'm just calling it Dr. Bird. Yeah. So let me say, I've taken on the morning shift. The morning shift was to possibly hit more of the European audience. Uh, I travel mainly to Paris. My wife is French, and we go to Paris every year, year and a half, so I'm there a lot. I, I, I stay in Bastille, and uh, I know the neighborhood pretty good, but I love traveling. I've been all throughout Italy, I've been to Germany, I've been to Cologne twice, that was for Gamescom, that was a great job. If you guys are out there, I loved that job, that was fun. Uh, we did uh, Warhammer suits for THQ, and I was in a giant ultramarine costume, and that was a hell of a job. That was a great job I got to travel with. Uh, I went to Spain in that. I went, let's say, Germany twice. Uh, I was in Birmingham, uh, in England, and where else? Well, in Birmingham, I was taking a cab there from the airport, and, and the, uh, the, the cab driver was British. He goes, oh, where are you going? And I, go, I was all Birmingham, and he just sort of looked at me and he laughed. He goes, no, you're not. You're going to Birmingham. So it's like, you, please forgive my American twang for all you out there. We've got a lot of popping consonants, but I'm hearing myself. So it's strange to talk to all of you while I've got a boom mic on. Okay. I'll go over what I'm pulling out here in just a minute. Let's see. I said I wasn't going to do any dremeling here, but I lied. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sure, man. That was Jess's idea. Jess. What's that? Thanks, Give Jess. Okay. Now, like I said earlier, I want to do a little bit more work on this because it's still mine. I don't have to give it off to the world without doing every little thing I want to. And I like details. Uh, and these are the kind of details that I feel like I've got going as sort of my, my build motif. These are things I like to do. Again, I'm not taking a large toolbox. I try to consolidate all my stuff. I've got a lot of tools. So I try, try to put the, the ones in a little go box. Magical little go box here. So these are the hoods that I've pre-made. Let me grab my on the Stan Winston school site, and it was from a guy, and I'm forgetting his name, but he, uh, he was in Germany, and he said that there was a there was a dramatic jump in progress between the time that uh, we started the magic sculpt and then started dremeling, and he was right. When I watched that at the end of the part one, and then you pick up in the part two. They had, and this is, I don't know why they did it, but you're right. Uh, but they cut out a lot of us sculpting the face while it was still softer, while it was still in the, its moldable magical, magic sculpt form. And uh, when I first saw, of course, I was like, who's complaining? But uh, the guy was totally right. And if there's anything I can help you with, look me up on my Facebook page. Ask me any questions. I usually get back to everybody within a week. It'll depend on how busy I am, what I'm working on, but I usually, while I'm working on something on my own, I'll take pictures of it and I'll post the, the progress on the website. That's just the progress of, of what I do in my garage. It, I, lo I love the feedback and I love, uh, I don't mind the questions either, so hit me up. Okay, this was, an all, this was a totally complete mask. The goggles went up, everything worked. It's got leather on the bottom. All enough. Uh, when I do use them, when I'm using any kind of magnet, I like to use the cylinder magnets because I can just take a drill bit, let's say, and I'm gonna, when I talk about this stuff, I'm going to talk in inches. This is what I know. If I was trying to be accurate with my centimeters, I wouldn't. But just translate what I say to whatever your, your, the measurements you use are. So if we had a, uh, this is a one-eighth drill bit. If I had a one-eighth <clears throat> cylinder magnet, I could just drill a hole with this bit, and then using that magnet, it would fit almost perfectly already into that piece, and we just super glue it in. That way I'm not having to 
do a lot of patchwork to get past any details that I've already destroyed. We just go further into it. Uh, but if you can, if you can find magnets uh, in a cylinder size, you can also just find the drill bit in that same size. So that's how I do that. Uh, the blue tape here, that's where I'm working. I wanted to protect what I already had laid down. So let's see, these pieces. This is the left. I know because there's a little L drawn on there. I'm making hoods. These hoods are going to land right here. When I did this piece, I used clean clay or a key. I didn't do those one at a time. I'll go back over those with an X-Acto blade or a scribe tool, but I set lines like this or where you've got this tight group of lines with a wire brush. This material is durable enough that a wire brush isn't going to just strip the clay off the form. This is also when it's completely kicked and hardened. But I'm taking these wire brushes and I'm grooving them deeply into there and I'm just continuing in the same direction. It pops out those kind of details. I like those details. To me, that's what makes it look, it makes it look Sometimes it looks like petrified wood. Sometimes it looks like skull bone. Uh, you get like, especially I've got I've got a boar skull and a cow skull, some ram skulls. But you've get you've got all these lines where the grain of the the bone itself. It's like where all the plates connect. The bones still grow in a direction. But the older ones, the more antiqued ones, uh, the more stressed with age they are. The more they have this separation, this grain. And and I think that this is a great way to get that in your skull like masks or just to uh, make it a mystery material. Like I'm not trying to suggest that this is all bone or it's a shell, but I do want it to look like a completely different material. I don't want it to be so recognizable. If people want to think it's bone or wood, that's great, but- uh, If you want to use the cylinder ones that I'm talking about, that's it's readily there. There's also flat, rectangular, there's any shape. There's, there's shapes with holes in the middle, so you can make sort of some trapped donut looking thing. But, uh, I would say buy yourself some magnets and if you do Uh oh, we lost the battery. Lost the battery. Lost the battery. Hold on. Let me swap with you, Maddie, and then I'll This oh. isn't playing either. It is, it is. Yeah, you're you're good. You're good, you handsome son of a gun. Yappity yap, yeah. Hello. A week. A guy like this one, this is more complicated, multiple segments, multiple features, uh, articulated uh, dreads. Uh, again, I'm going to say three weeks a month. Yep. That's even if I was uh, working on it full time. Because also there's, there's always moments of discover, discovery. Um, they take a while. So, and that's, look, I, I've kind I didn't make up masks or anything, but I'm the, I'm the magic sculpt mask guy. So I've got, I've got a lot of this refined. Don't stick yourself to that kind of schedule and don't worry if you're falling behind what I'm saying. This isn't, unless you're doing this and you promised a friend you'd have it done, it, it, you've got time to work on it. I'd say if you're learning and you're working on this, uh, take your time while you're learning how to use the materials. I don't even suggest jumping into something past what we've done on the on the, uh, the our lesson piece that size. That's a good size to start with. But uh, hell, if you're doing a helmet, you want to sculpt over a helmet, go for it. But do give yourself the time. Don't race this. This is your art. You need to you need to not feel pressured right away. You need to learn the craft. with it it's this isn't the kind of thing I have to make for a client right away so um, I do take my time uh, let's see another long part what is the longest part sometimes dremeling sometimes just sculpting it especially if you're not satisfied with it or you didn't have anything in mind I, I really don't have a single one answer of what takes the longest but uh, take your time with all of them all right, I'm going to get back into this guy here. So what I was saying about uh, I had a, a, a clay barrier piece that came off this goggle. I sculpted it right on the tape. And then I uh, used the magic sculpt to sculpt over the top of that. I went ahead and dropped that piece of uh, malleable epoxy clay right over this tape. Uh, the tape acting as a barrier, that way I didn't have to use any release. I wasn't directly messing up the paint underneath it. But these are the kind of hoods I created. I've got one for the right one for the left, 
And pretty much what I'm going to do is install those now. I want to go over what I did finish-wise again on these guys. And I do have to do a little more finish work to them. I'm just looking into my uh, bags just... If you have a brick and mortar school, suddenly you're stuck with something that's a lot less flexible when it comes to teaching. This is about this school. What I like about this school is you get to pick what you want to do. Do you want to learn to sculpt? Do you want to learn to paint? You've got a full broad spectrum of stuff. There's even like niche stuff in the effects world that you're going to learn here. There's, there's full on lessons and then there's the the demo cheat do it fast lesson way to so that will this this is going to teach you how to work with the more premium feature films that everybody wants to work on the higher budget stuff that will have a little time to build but this is also going to teach you how to do stuff fast a lot of us go on like my stuff this is not how we make stuff uh, in the studios. So we use Magic Scope for campus you. and it's accessible hit it up uh, check out all the free stuff they've got a, also they do sell all their lessons, but now it's also, look at their YouTube channel. It is the most complete FYI, or do-it-yourself, DYI YouTube channel I've ever seen. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Thanks, Bruce. You're awesome. Hey, uh, we got another question for you. Uh, Matthew Walter wants to know, uh, when you make a mask with a huge protrusion, like a horn or large spikes, do you typically build those separately or attached? I build them separately. And I now, do. do you add wires or armature to save clay? Um, you know, depending on how thick a hole. Uh, you know, if you, if you can throw up a piece for me, Matt, I've got uh, a piece in there. There's the, it's a minotaur head. It's the... I, I actually can't throw it into the broadcast. Okay. But I did post it on our Facebook well, page. I've got it on my wallet. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to show it really quick. Yeah, you can hold it right up to this camera. Noony, noony, noo. Okay, tell me when I'm in frame and everything here. So this guy, can you see it? Am I in frame? I have no monitor. Tell me. Uh, yep, good? you're good. Okay. Uh, uh. That, those are real horns. Those are steer horns. When it comes to this uh, animal reserve, and uh, these aren't, so I'm trying not to buy poached horns. So when I use elephant tusks in my mask, what I like to use, no, I use, uh, I use all sorts of antelope, uh, Bone. I, I got a Krampus mask I want to build because you know everybody's going gaga for Krampus, and then there's some awesome designs out there. I saw s some uh, stuff from a it was a fair in Austria or a, a, a winter solstice kind of deal in Austria with the Krampus. It was incredible looking. Uh, I want to get into that, but you got to use armature wire. So yes, and I do build them separately. Also, if you build them separately. The, the bonus is you can alter them. If you make something and you come back the next day, this happens to me a lot, uh, where I come back the next day and uh, I get picky with myself on these. So I'll just be, you know, like, I'm not happy with it. I want to change it. If you've got your piece and it's separate, you can change it. And it might be just as minute as an, an angle being different, like if you're building horns. I was actually going to do, I've got, I think in the lesson I talk about using Magic Sculpt, rolling it out. Whenever magic scope we have left or whatever epoxy clay we have left, I roll it out and I make sort of a claw. I've got all these pieces that are about this long. Great work in it. And he was only an hour away from me. Again, that was like the benefit of where I was living. I was living in uh, Northern California up in the wine country. And this was in, this was just below me. This was in Marin. So I, uh, I cold called him one day and, and, and that's how you do it. You just call the place up and see if they're hiring or talk to them about how they take on new personnel. But uh, I've been doing this for, good God, what is that? Is that 21 years, 92? Anyway, I started out in a creature shop as an apprentice. Uh, from there, I went to another place in the Bay Area called Midland Productions. They did, uh, we did a lot of motion-based ride simulation kind of things. Allow. We did a Tower Records commercial, but from there I was a model maker with sculpting chops. There I worked at uh, Matt World Digital as sort of an apprentice gopher guy. I was helping out in the model shop, but I would also run around the Bay Area taking photographs for lighting reference of uh, interesting looking buildings, uh, whether it was skylines or uh, arenas, you know, the Oakland Arena, uh, any of the domes or candlestick, just so you get an interesting building and you get the light fall for reference for matte paintings. And again, some model work there. 
then it got slow and that's when I monster. So I'm sculpting out of foam to make pieces. We are we started with rocks, then we made some boats. The guys, the art directors there liked our work so much that they sent us as a team. Me and a guy, Mike, I don't remember his last name, but uh, uh, he sent a, they sent us to sculpt the ride vehicle, which is supposed to be a, uh, it's a big Imagineering deal. And uh, I didn't like Imagineering. I'll tell you that right now. I still don't like them. I hated it. I did not like them there at all. Uh, it, was, it was nice to play with the big tools, but what a corporate cult. And that is not what I'm here for. I did not like it. I'll take, I'll take you, Indie Job. Yeah, let me, that was a bridge I had. Let me throw some dynamite over my shoulder. Not supposed to do that stuff. That's not professional. I made a lot of great friends there, but I hated that place. <laughs> Fuck you, Mouse. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, uh. Uh, and now it's just the Imagineering side. Marvel, Disney, I'm all about you. But you're a different entity. The views expressed by Bruce T. Mitchell do not necessarily review, reflect the views of Stan Winston School. So, we love Disney. Bye. <laughs> sorry, I hated Imagineering. So, let me make sure I got the right size drill bit here. Let me have some of my more angry coffee. Coffee. Hey, they don't censor on YouTube, do they? Ah, oh, I just swore in front of my kids. They're fine. They hear it. There, they, you know what? There's a. Uh, I end up swearing in front of my kids, not around the house, but when I'm driving. It's uh, it just happens. Okay. Also, when it comes to a drill bit that I want to use, and I'm going to use a screw, what I do is I just make sure that the the drill bit itself covers up the body of the screw. I got plenty of battery power. And that's my left one. I'm going to eyeball this. This is, a, I mean, this is a pretty rough look. This is, I mean, it's got its symmetry, but at the same time, if I'm a little off, I give myself that kind of grace. I like pieces that have an organic quality. Uh, I don't think those cheers are for me. Okay, this is my left. I know it's my left because I drew a little L inside with a pencil. What I would recommend doing, and you're going to need to, because you have rights and left pieces and they are somewhat symmetrical. I mean, these are done, they're done by, uh, by hand. They're not totally mirrored, but at the same time, if you confuse them, and you're not going to know by the top which one's which. But uh, like I, said, I popped it off, first thing I did was draw a little L on one, an R on the other. That lets me know that I'm got the right and the left. Okay. Let's see. I wanted to show you a little bit of wire brushing and sanding. Okay, again, the wire brush, this kind of material, this is a great way to get that texture, that kind of bone-like, old, petrified wood. Just a, It's a great to find it there. This will point itself out to you when I give it the paint, and I'll be sure to hold it up and show you as well. But there's sort of a random quality. As you use these, wire, th these wires, they're going to go where they want. You've got to force the direction, but the wire is pretty much going to find its own channel. I like that kind of random quality in my work. It helps give it a, an organic, natural look. So be sure to do that. Be sure to let those happy accidents happen. A lot of what I go that I rely on now for a look, I was discovered as, as a happy accident. It was something I did once. I liked the way it worked. Tried to remember how did that happen, and uh, apply it in my work. Plan it out. You gotta once you get comfortable with using your materials and seeing how they work, the things that you find to be sort of a random quality are going to uh, become part of your your trade and craft. They're going to be things that you learn how to manipulate and make them do what you want or at least how to learn to work with them to get the effect that you want.
So happy accidents are the best way to learn things. When with fantastic one step that does all the work for you, that's not the craft. This craft is process after process. So be sure that you focus on this step that you are out now and don't try to jump ahead. You're just going to disappoint yourself. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, I don't have rubber gloves today, so I'm not going to paint my thumbs. I'm just set that right there. Right. Here's what I am going to do, though. I'm going to paint directly over my little left and right marks, so I'm going to mark it again. Just on the side here. R. And then I'm also... going to take some tape. Organization, when you have, uh, I'll tell you, honestly, I'm, I'm a kind of a slob. My work is messy, and uh, my workstations get messy. And I don't always clean them up right away, but you do need to be organized enough to keep track of the pieces you're working on. So, I had to come here anyway. Okay, left. Go ahead and finish painting this. It's not totally dry. And it is pretty cool in here, so I'm just going to get this going. Oh, you know what? If anybody's got a question, it'd be a good time to hit me. This is a little bit of a process, and I got my hands going, so I don't know. Well, it's not much more. It's just, and probably this one, too. So I buy bigger kits. I buy, it's almost like each bucket that makes up one of the halves is about a two-gallon size. Uh, so I haven't purchased any more epoxy in quite a while. I'll try mag or, uh, epoxy sculpt again. I'll... Uh, I'll forever use whichever one wants to use me and sponsor me. So uh, if you're listening, I'll totally sell out for your clay endorsement. Um, I'm going to let these dry. And see, what we're doing is just getting that full coverage on, on our goggle hoods. Now, when it comes to uh, the finish, I'm going to leave the underside of these hoods black. It's important that the goggles that you looked out of, because you have closed coverage, the rest around the lens needs to be black. This allows you to see. If you have, uh, if it's a light color or like a white or the numbers to have a, a better reach. So please go ahead and hit that up. But feel free to ask me any of the questions you have when your uh, artistic endeavors. You know, if you need a little more help on getting. Uh, your magic sculpt to lay down smooth. I know how to do that. I'll even tell you. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold out on this stuff. I mean, we'll make another lesson and we'll get into that. Um, if it seems like I was holding out on this mask, it's just the amount of time that I can dedicate to a lesson. It's just the amount of time that the guys can dedicate to a lesson. Uh, as I was saying, it takes me. If I had the full time to work on it, I could make one of these in a week, week and a half, but up to three weeks. That would be a very, very expensive to shoot lesson. So we have to keep it short and sweet. So where you may want to get into one of the full head things, I'm trying to show you just the foundation approach. Also, I love to get the pictures of stuff that people have done. Uh, I've one of, one of my friends, Ryan, made a piece. There's a guy, I want to say his name is Brad Goodspeed. Actually, it's for another studio or you know, if you're just starting, work that you've done on your own. Um, the guys see all sorts of stuff, and I, I'm actually often look, uh, asked to look at somebody's portfolio, and I do. I'll, I'll look at it, and, and it's hard to say without knowing exactly what you've done so far, but at the same time, when you show your work to somebody, I really doubt anybody's going to go, hey, man, that's crap. This is, uh, you don't have it. They're, they're, we're all guys that had the dream and we're all guys that have found a way in. 
and for the most part, we encourage each other. Uh, it, it does get rough sometimes because you are in a position as a freelance worker, you've got to maintain a relationship, uh, a good and positive relationship with the people that you work at. Uh, I may have destroyed that with Disney, but at the same time, it's uh, it's something that you you got to do. And by by doing that, it, it that what I'm saying is that goes into checking out books of people that want to get in. Yeah, you'll you'll get pointers if anybody you know whatever their their hone or skill is, they'll they'll help you. They'll they'll tell you for the most part. If they'll look at your book, you'll get a good advice. A lot of times, some of the bigger guys. For a lot of the guys used to be these down to Southern California, I knew it was getting there in two days, but I'd wait three days, and then I'd call to confirm the package delivery and just make it sound legitimate. But then also, you might sound familiar at that time, so I'm just even though it's a very basic relationship, hello, I my name is, I'm making sure this guy here. You are slowly learning how to work in the effects field. It's it's super tiny, but that's how you start networking. Uh, so persistence, man, keep going. And you got another one? Another question? Sure. Yeah, uh, we actually do. How many custom-made tools do you have? That's from Steven Buono. Ooh. I didn't bring any, but I've got a bunch. I've got some, uh, and mainly what I've got for custom tools, or not mainly, the ones I'm thinking of are, like I use a lot of wire brushes. I'll take heavy gauge wire and then clamp those around a brass tube while I've got some epoxy or super glue drying. So I've got these really long fingered stiff rakes and I'll bend those into like a, a rake shape, like a rake you would rake leaves with. Uh, I've got some of those. I've also got some pieces that I may have one here. Ah, I don't see it right off, but I've got saw. <laughs> eh. But uh, I'm scrubbing this down, and you can see that what I end up with is the details, the recesses, the wire brush marks. Those are the kind of details, again, I like. I don't know, I don't know when this goes out of focus or when it's in focus, but uh, we get a lot of detail. All right. Let's see here. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Almost done with this. And again, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave this side black. I want it to be black. I want it to when it's on, no light goes up there. We've already got a lens in here, which is, which we put the lens in so it looks good and you don't see the eyes of the person wearing it. We have an anonymity when we wear this mask. But at the same time, putting a lens on does begin to obstruct the vision. So I don't want to obstruct that anymore. And I am doing that, but I'm doing that for an aesthetic reason. So if I could at least go ahead and paint it black underneath. These are all scratch-built, one-off, one-of-a-kind masks that uh, I've created pretty much in my garage. I do special effects for a living, but at the same time, I'm not always pleased with what I do So uh, or the projects we work on. It's nice to have a job, but these do become jobs. It's a cool job, but... I find that making, continuing to make my own stuff only makes me better at work. It lets me, uh, it lets me treat work like a job. They're paying me to make it. I don't get artistically involved if they don't want it. That you know, it may not be the kind of thing. Well, I, I don't agree with the look of that. It doesn't matter. They're paying you. You better make it that way. So, save your, uh, you know, unleash your creative demons on your own time, and that's what I do here. I forgot to bring a paint palette, so I'm going to use my Starbucks cup lid as a paint palette. One thing you'll learn in the effects business right away is being resourceful. So this isn't like some paperclip bubblegum bomb that MacGyver would make, but I think it's pretty resourceful. Thanks, Starbucks. Mm, we're going to trash. Thank trash. you. Trash? Talking trash, talking more trash. If you're back, I was uh, uh, I was singing Disney's praises earlier, and I meant it. I love them. 
We love Disney. Who are uh, unaware of the films you've worked on, can you talk about some of the projects you've been on that they'd, they'd know? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'm going to go backwards just because it's the easiest way to remember if I start to, uh, and I'll, I'll still probably forget uh, a few. Um, I've been working on Legacy Effects for the most part, but uh, Pacific Rim, we did 38, 36 or 38 Jaeger pilot suits, and that was all the different countries, whether it was the, the Chinese suit, the Russian suits. Uh, Pacific Rim, I worked there as a fabricator, and we made a lot of armor. It was some great looking pieces, too. And that, uh, I don't care what you thought of the movie, that was a fun job to work. Uh, time wise, it was, you know, jobs like that are big and they get tough, but it was cool to be working on something that was not a sequel, a reboot. Um, or just a, another continuation of of something we've seen a million times. I mean, sure, an anime you have. I mean, you know, I just saw last week Honest Trailers. Honest Trailers has a really kick in the balls, hilarious oh, review no. of uh, Pacific Rim, and they were pretty accurate. But it was a great job to work on. Um, I did a lot of the leather. Cra I did the leather craft for Whiplash's characters, both the hero suit and the stunt suit. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, I directed Star Wars, the first <laughs> one. I was three years old. It's a and lot of work. And your name was really George hard to Lucas a at the time. At three. No. Um, let's see. Also, like movies that I've worked on. Let's see, what else? Uh, Blade 2, Minority Report. Those are just some favorite ones just because we got to go kind of crazy. When you get a movie that's a, a big sci-fi world often, no matter how intently they try to design it, the art directors or production designers are always going to forget something. They're trying to create a whole world, and you're always going to forget something. So jobs like that I dig because... If they liked Jeremy Aiello, it was, it was sort of a canister shape. It was no test of his skills. And it was molded by the mold department and then uh, given to me, and I took it home and just kind of had that as a side project where I constructed that in my garage. That, that, was, uh, that was fun. Um, I, do, I do do side projects in my garage. Like when I'm not doing these, I'll, I'll, do, uh, I'll do stuff for mainly shops that I've worked at that they've got something that there's a, it's a little too much for them to make or they, they trust you and they want you to do it, which is always an honor. So you got to do it. You got to keep those opportunities alive. Like I work at Legacy right now, but at the same time, I may not be working there in a couple months after the job's over. So I need to go call KMB and say I'm available or any of the other shops I work at. That's, that, that is one of the things you need to keep in mind if you look at this kind of work. Once you get into a place, Man, send Christmas cards, and I mean that as a broad general thing, but, but keep in touch. Say hi, especially if you like them. Keep in touch. Uh, it is all networking, and you want to stay fresh in people's minds. And when they have projects that come through that have 60 to 80 to 120 people working in a hurry, uh, it's easy to get forgotten when the job is over. So, so do keep in touch. Um, other movies I've worked on. 13 Ghosts, Warriors of Virtue, Narnia 1 and 2, Ghosts of Mars, Dinosaur, The Cave, Spy Kids, Operation Dumbo Drop, Looney Tunes, Cobwebs, The Shadow, Captain Courage, Flat Dog, Delta Knights, Spider-Man, Robots of Mars, Minority Reports, 13th Warrior. So it goes on and on. Oh, yeah, here. I'll show you a portfolio. I got a lot of paint out right now. Actually, I'd like to do this okay, once I wrap this up. Okay, let's do some painting. Great. Um, um, while you start painting, Bruce, we have another question from Stephen Buono. Sure. Uh, have you ever had a job that intimidated you or was extremely challenging? Yeah, this one right now. No, um, uh, the only time you're ever really intimidated, and I say this as somebody who's, who's been around a little whatever, and now you're working with that. And sometimes when you look at that piece, and uh, it's it's intimidating. Now you're you know you're working against the the mathematics of what a machine can do versus what you can do. Uh, that's intimidating. Uh, but it's part of the process now. It's part of the toolkit. We get those and we refine those. And by refine, when you get rapid prototypes, grown, milled pieces. The, I always call it topography, but it's sort of a staircasing. Um, it's a resolution, if you will, in 3D that you have to sand out or refine. 
So you, you are part of that process right now. I give it two weeks, you won't need to be, because it's amazing what uh, computers and uh, rapid prototype machines are capable of doing, and that's only going to continue. That's, uh, that is kind of, honestly, a bummer when you look around the industry. There's a lot of fantastic sculptors that aren't sculpting nearly as much as they used to because they don't have to. But that doesn't mean it's dead. It's just opened it up in another discipline, but another direction. Somebody is still creating that stuff. It is in 3D. I'm, uh, I don't do much computer work at all. I'm Mitchell, I'm a special effects artist. I'm primarily a fabricator. I currently work at Legacy Effects. I've worked at several uh, effects shops, KMB, Quantum Creations, Patrick Satopoulos, Edge Effects. So I started out at Chris Wallace Effects as an apprentice. I've gone on to do uh, model making. I've worked at Grant McEwen Designs for a short time. Uh, digital domain, I worked at Imagineering as a foam sculptor. Uh, everything from background to rides to ride vehicles. That led me back into uh, creature effects. Uh, but these are what I make in my own time. This is, this is my uh, creative outlet. I'll go home from working on the shop or in the shops for various shows. And uh, you don't always get to make the calls in there. You're working for somebody else. It's a professional environment. So this is where I get to kind of cut loose and do what I want. These masks I make, they're, they're pretty much all made out of epoxy clays. These are, I'm using Magic Sculpt. You can use epoxy sculpt as well. It really doesn't make a difference. I used to uh, favor Magic Sculpt because of the price difference when it was all big experimental stuff and I work kind of large, so I needed something that was cheap. Um, most of my masks have attributes that I, I call the dyna, I call this where though. So I grew up in an environment where it's like the imagination wasn't just something that, uh, that it wasn't shunned. It's like I started getting into comic books. My dad used that excuse to start revisiting comic books. He ended up, he passed away about 10 years ago, but I've got, I've got like three comic book boxes of just Sergeant Rock that were his that he purchased when uh, we started getting back into comics together. And uh, that's just a little bit about me. I gotta say my parents always fostered my uh, imagination and always made sure I had art tools and supplies. Uh, to play with. I was, uh, personally, I was a horrible student. I was, uh, I was diagnosed as dyslexic when I was in junior college. That didn't do me a lot of good uh, from uh, my grade school point of view. I was always the kid that was drawing in the margins. I always showed a high aptitude for uh, art classes. Whatever art class was going in, I was in the advanced level class. But uh, I didn't particularly like sticking to the curriculum. I never, uh, I was never into painting that bowl of fruit that they always try to make you paint. I just wanted to paint skulls and monsters. I was told to stop painting monsters several times, but at the same time, as a kid, I was reading, uh, I was reading all the magazines that were available. I'm 41 now. I'm sort of an Iron Maiden character, and this right here, this is, this is the end of part two in the video, and uh, we want to do a part three. And part three will have all the goggles in it. That's all the fun stuff. But to do that stuff, you need to have the foundation. You need something you can build off of. So here's the homework. We'll get into the fun stuff later. And I, I mean, this is all fun. I dig it, but I, I'm not happy with it. With uh, And I'm an artist. I'm never freaking happy with anything I make unless there's a deadline or somebody takes it away and you get to start on something new. So this is still floating around and it bugs me when I see it because it's not finished. But we're going to go ahead and put uh, goggles on it and then another lesson and a mouthpiece. Not going to do it now. This is a three-hour sort of hello, I'm Bruce sort of moment here at Kamikaze. And... Uh, I'm working on a small table with a limited amount of time, so I'm just kind of trying to review what we've done here. Again, all these masks are made out of, uh, I'm using Magic Sculpt, and it's an epoxy clay. Uh, I'm going to set this down. Yes. If you're not familiar with Magic Sculpt, Magic Sculpt was actually created in uh, the 1870s, and it's, uh, it's a two-part uh, putty, and it's crafted out of unicorn horns on one half and baby teeth in the other. And they grind these up, you mix them together, and it forms this marvelously dense material that whatever your choice or taste, you can sculpt directly over the top of that. That's what I did with this one. I did take it apart. I took the, uh, the visor housing off and sculpted over that separately, sculpted over the helmet itself. I'm dremeling in all the material. I'm using carbide bits or pineapple bits to get all the, the worn in detail. And then I'm using wire brushes and sandpaper over the top of that. Uh, the mouthpiece is not articulated. Everybody wants to grab it and bend it, but it's it's got some armature wire in it. But it's also 
not flexible. I wouldn't encourage that. I don't let people do that. But this is uh, this is something I liked a lot. This is just a hinge. It's a cabinetry hinge called an invisible hinge, and you use it so carpenters use it or cabinet makers use it so you don't see the hinge work on the side of the cabinet. You open it up and it's completely handled in there. So you've got one or two of these and a door and it opens up and then you see the hinge work. But I love the flow of it. It looks like NVG or night vision goggle kind of work. And I always dug that and, and whether it was uh, helicopter pilots or you know that uh, special forces look. But what I brought this here to show you is you can go ahead and take a rigid form helmet and build directly over the top of that if you want to experiment and maybe you don't want to make a mask. You, there's other options. Build over the top of something. That also works with any sort of the kind of stuff you can do and don't be afraid to experiment. I experiment uh, quite often. Hey Matt, how much time do we have? Uh, we have me? about 20... Uh, no, you're actually technically done. Really? Oh, You're let me show you one done. more thing. I, that went really, really fast. See? That went really fast. I knew it wouldn't get much done, but let me show you one thing here. Or how much longer do you have? You can go, I would say, a half hour, and then we got to get to that panel. Okay. All right. Uh, while, while Bruce is stepping away, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, we are at Stanley's Kamikaze at the LA Convention Center. We're going to be live broadcasting from the Stan Winston School booth all weekend long. Uh, Bruce D. Mitchell here, brilliant uh, creature effects artist, uh, has been demonstrating his, uh, his own approach to mask making using magic sculpt and other materials. And uh, during his day job, he works on, you know, the Avengers, Robocop, Pacific Rim, the Iron Man movies, it's a living whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, this man is absolutely a, not only a brilliant artist, but a great teacher. And we have two great lessons from Bruce. On I'd like to know what you want to know about this. Again, this isn't necessarily the kind of work you'll be doing in an effect shop. Should that be the kind of thing you're pursuing? I, I'm, I'm trying to throw this out there more to the, to the cosplayers, the convention goers, the guys that want to make costumes for themselves and want to make something special. These are, these are some techniques that you can do. And I, I like to do them this way because I don't necessarily have to make a mold before I can go on to the next process. I've got something rigid that I can, I can do one-off experimental pieces on. You can always go back and perfect this, uh, make your molds or whatnot. This, this material is fantastic for making molds on top of. So I'm going to tidy up here just to make some room. But what I wanted to go over was, I, and in my book, there's a few pieces I have where symmetry becomes a strong issue. How do you achieve symmetry is a question I get a lot. Because uh, if you go up on that Facebook page, I was talking about earlier in the week, I, I started this guy. And um, let me find my pencil. And OK. This started out, if you go to that Facebook page and you look at it, that's Bruce D. Mitchell. That's the one without the period after the D. Honestly, I, I only left it like that because they wouldn't change, the, they wouldn't let me change the name after I got like 500 people and I'm talking about symmetry. I had one side, one side was way higher than the other. So I had to grind a lot away. I got to grind away so much that I actually used a different epoxy. I used uh, JB Weld Quick. That's a two part epoxy, you mix it together. It hardens in about 30 minutes. I reinforced it with that and ground it down. Did a paper template, cut it out. Take that paper template, reverse it. That's gonna tell you your differences on something. If you're working on symmetry, that's, uh, that's crucial. Anything will help you out. And those are quick, eyeballed, hands-on ways to do it. Also, flat surface here. I'm going to take this flat surface. I'm going to put a pencil mark right here. I'm going to do the same thing on the exact opposite side. Uh, a lot of times, you can do this kind of deal, but do the other side too, because you're not with a flat piece. You're going to fall somewhere in the middle. So I'm going to put that. Uh, uh, that. Okay, why is the center line important? Well, if you're going to do something that's symmetry or symmetrical, you're going to want to be able to measure off of your center line. That's going to start to tell you when if you measure off from there, you're going to get these corner lines. You're going to make sure that those are tight. You're going to make sure that uh, your, the width of your eyes is the same. Um, 
and and uh, and that's about it. Let me show you something. Uh, I'll get more into that as I make this piece. I constantly post stuff up on my Facebook. Go to it. But it's been a pleasure to hang out and talk with you. I'm with the Stan Winston School of Character Arts at Kamikaze. Stan Lee's Kamikaze. Come on down. Check it out. We've got Legacy Effects right next door. I'm currently working there. We've got all our Marvel stuff. We've got the Iron Monger. We've got War Machine. We've got the Mark 42. Uh, we've got Whiplash. We've got the drones. We've got uh, all your Marvel characters that Legacy has worked on. So come on down and see it. It's a great event. I'm going to give it up to Kamikaze. I didn't... It was pretty dead yesterday and I was I was, I gotta say I I didn't mind that it's like Comic-Con but you can move around so if Comic-Con is always something that's intimidating to you and you're in the Los Angeles area you don't need lodging for this one it's not a three-hour drive come on down it's the third year of this event and it really looks like they're getting it nailed down so uh, I'm gonna hang out and go to another panel but I'm gonna go look around too so Bruce D. Mitchell Saying hi for the Stan Winston School of Character Arts. Demand a part three. If you're into this stuff, demand it. And uh, we'll do it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Woo! Put your hands together out there in cyberspace. Thanks, brother. Oh, absolutely. Thank you Anytime, so much. Man. Don't go anywhere I'm in the booth. Stay, Au stick around. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao. Buenas noches. Uh, Boba. Boba Fett. That's about all I got. Boba, can I borrow you? Do you mind being on camera? We have Boba Fett. Uh, why don't you swivel around here, uh, Johnny? Uh, I am... Hey, how's it going? What's your name? Matt, Matt, Matt wait for a second, will you? All right, guys, we are here at Stanley's Kamikaze. There, this place is filled with cosplayers uh, like our friend Boba Fett here. Uh, what is your actual name? Uh, rubber and uh, I don't know what else they're, well, it's, they're using uh, within it. I, I notice it's pretty heavy. It feels real, oh, yeah. which is cool. Yeah, yeah awesome. it's great. Uh, well, well, very cool, man. Thanks for uh, creating a kick-ass costume and sharing it with us. That's Rob, everybody. Uh, I'm going to bring cosplayers galore in here. We're going to meet some people. Thank you. Hey, you I can't keep the gun, can I? No, sorry. No? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to bring some more fun people in here. Uh, give me a second. I'm trying to eyeball a fun costume. Oh, here we go. Miss, miss with the makeup. Can you come here? Yes, come on in. Come on in. Just come right through. Watch your backs, guys. That's passed on. So. Well, what what I love about it is that it's not sad. It really is a party. And uh, when I die, I want to have a Day of the Dead celebration. I don't want some lame, <laughs> boring, sad. Cool. All right. What do you think of the convention? I love it. They did a really great job with um, Comic Kamikaze. I mean, it's. I mean, I've been to a few Comic Cons myself, and this is pretty, pretty rad. I mean, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I like it too, and I like that I don't have to drive to San Diego. Isn't that nice? <laughs> yes. Well, I live in San Diego, so I actually had to drive up to L.A., but either way, I mean, it's, it's still worth it, obviously. I mean, we're stuck in two hours, uh, but it's still cool. How does this compare to Comic-Con for you? It's, I mean, it's a little smaller, but it's just more cozy. You're actually able to interact with people a little bit more. Oh, yeah, yeah you saved the... Of course. Yeah, I know him. Um, what about the big old hammer? How did you make it? Um, actually, my boyfriend's responsible for that. Thanks for joining. Oh, hold on one sec. There you go. You're awesome. Well, thanks for visiting us from Asgard. Well, what do you expect? I had to go come down and check up on on Mr. Lee and everyone here. And, you know, being the god of thunder, I got to pop in and see Jane once in a while. I recently found out about this man called Wayne Campbell. He said that... Keep talking. Keep talking. Wayne, yeah. Wayne Campbell said Ed, that, oh, great, great, great. that if... Jane was a president, she would be Abraham Lincoln. He's your other father. Yay, indeed, mortal. Well, enjoy. All right. Uh, let's see. Who else do we have here? We're doing a little... That was the real Thor, guys. The real Thor. He's much smaller than, than you'd think he'd be, but that was the real Thor. Uh, how's it going? What are you? Come in here. Come on in. What are you? Uh, 
I'm one of the bosses from an old video game. What old video game? It's Captain Commando. Any Captain Commando uh, fans out there? This is apparently a character from that game, a, a boss, a bad guy. What was his name? It's Strum Jr. Drum Jr.? Strum or Strom. You, you're not sure and you dressed up like him? They never really explained it. <laughs> what were his powers? He was really fast and he had a harpoon gun. Are you pretty fast? Nah. So you're a slow version? Yeah. <laughs> That's alright. Are you having fun at Kamikaze? Yeah, I am. Your first Is it your first time out here? Yeah, at Kamikaze. Yeah. Do you guys all want to come and let, let us see your, your costumes? Come on, X-Men family. So what, who is, what is your wife then? Uh, X-23. X-23. Uh, yeah. So tell us about your costume. Did you, did you make your costume? I helped with the piping. With the, with the piping. So, so is this the piping here the, the, that goes around? Yes. Did it, did it take you a long time to do it? Yes. Yeah? And where are your claws, Wolverine? In the, in the bag. M Mom has the claws? Yeah. There we go. There are those claws. These look like you made these at home also. Yeah. 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 All the props I, I made for them. All the props you made. Wow. This is a pretty fancy costume. And then, and then who do we have here? Professor X. Professor X. Professor X. And t tell us, Professor X, what was, the, what was the, the thought and the inspiration that went into this costume? I didn't have to walk. You did, oh, you couldn't walk? <laughs> no, no, he didn't have to walk. He didn't have to walk. So you get to get pushed around all day. <laughs> yes. This, this, is, this is a child who's clearly thinking about how to save energy for later and how to maximize his Comic-Con experience. Yeah. That way we get to push him around all day. That way we get to push him around all day. You get to push him around all day. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm, I'm taking it that, that you are mom yeah. and that you were the other contributor to making Some these. And a humanoid centurion from Argelius 4. A humanoid centurion from Argelius 4. Now, now how do, humanoid. Humanoid centurion. The West Star Trek, that's where the reference comes from. Okay. okay. Now, is this a costume you bought or you made? Someone actually made this for me. And you know what? I usually, whenever I go to a convention, they usually go all out. I usually dress as Storm. And last year I was Jade from Mortal Kombat. Okay. But um, my friends bailed on me today. So I was like, I want to be comfortable, but still kind of badass in a way. So, so you came and you're rocking this solo. You're doing this without any support, any of team. And I'm sure you're not getting any attention or anybody saying, hey, can you jump in front of a camera and do a quick interview with me? <laughs> no, it's no. <laughs> no, no, no. Are you wearing a body stocking? I'm like, yeah, I get the pen. But it's comfortable. It's like wearing jammies. Who doesn't love jammies? I love jammies. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing with us. You look awesome. So have a good day. Whoa. Come on up. How we doing, man? So. Tell us about your costume. Tell us who you are. Well, um, I'm John Lynn. Los Angeles Lakers into a super costume. To a super costume. Well, I was Iron Man last year, regular colors. Okay. And then I was figuring I'm going to Kamikaze. It's in LA. It's right at the Staples. Lakers play there. I'm a lifetime Laker fan. So, put two and two together. That's pretty cool. And now, did, did you paint this all yourself? Did you have help? Did you tell, tell us the story about your, your costume coming together? Well, it's pretty much a start in a garage with a bunch of floor foam floor mats. This is uh, actually paper. I did paper cura to okay. um, make the form and then I put fiberglass over it, painted it, sanded it, painted it, sanded it. And then... Wow, so, so this is all your own fabrication. This is all your own work into going into this. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't go into a costume shop and buy anything. And, and how long did it take you to put all this together? About six months. About. Tell me about everything. Um, I did not make it myself. I okay. purchased all of it. But um, I really like the the anime, so I wanted to. Uh, I first got this to the Comic Con um, for um, for summer, and then uh, I saw about this Kamikaze, so I figured I'd use the same costume. Sweet man, that's pretty smart. So so you've been to Comic Con, you've been to Kamikaze. Um, how do they compare? Tell tell me what you like. Tell me about what what are the things that are different, and the things you like about this compared to Comic Con. Uh, it's a lot less crowded here. Uh, which is nice. You're not always running into people. There isn't a traffic jam of people everywhere you're trying to go. So that's what, one thing that I like more about Kamikaze for sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, things that I do like about Kamikaze more is like you do get to see a lot more people, so you do see more costumes, which is probably one of my favorite things about these conventions is just seeing people dressed up.
Cool. So, so what? So, so far today, what's the best costume you've seen here? The best costume I've seen here. Um, I didn't really like that Iron Man costume. Um, what else have I seen? That's by far one of the best that I've cool. seen. Cool. Cool. Well, man, you got a great costume, and thank you uh, for for stopping by, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the costume. All right. Sweet. Nice to meet you, man. All right, all right, uh, Captain America. That, that is a massive looking piece of hardware. Like, if you guys can't see this, that is, that is a, that, that is a, that is, I'm, I'm nervous. I mean, that, that is intense. All right, let me, let me hold this baby. Here, you, we'll change. You hold the mic, I'll hold the VAR. Right? Holy cow. <laughs> this is, this is serious. That is, that is a, that is a powerful weapon. Yeah. If I was walking down the street in some back alley trick or treating or something, <laughs> I would be like, you should not want that. No, like, you, you could run into some problems. You will run it. You will surely run into problems. Run into problems. <laughs> run into problems. So how do you avoid running into problems? Do you, so do, I know we have security checkpoints yeah. when we when we walk in here. Here I'll take that one. We can we can swap. How, how do you do, so really you are first, and then tell me about how this. Yeah. Okay, Raphael. I'm Raphael. It took me three months to make. I sculpted it, cast, uh, molded it, and casted it with rubber and foam. Three months. Three months from start to and how did you get? I, I, I'm, I have so many questions. I don't even know where to start. Like, how did you get the idea to be a turtle? Had you worked on fabrication stuff before? Um, I started sculpting maybe about ten years ago. Okay. I just I just wanted to learn how to make stuff, so I bought a kit, learned how to make a mask, and went from there. So I did the Predator first, of course. Stan Winston did Predator, and then I said, "Man, I got to do a turtle. Who doesn't want to be a?" Turtle? I'm just gonna do it. So three months ago, I just got went at it, and here I am today. Sweet. And so, can you tell me a little about what are what are what, did you, what materials did you use to put together your costume? Okay, um, it's made out of lake, just regular slip cast latex and uh, two part foam. Two part foam. Yeah. So, so the thing that I'm immediately coming to mind, and I'm guessing probably some of our viewers want, how hot are you inside that suit right now, and how many pounds do you expect to lose over the course of the day? Probably at least half my weight, I would think. Yeah. And it's really, you know, it's really hot, but as long as I take off my head about every 15 minutes, I'm good. As long as I take off my head, I should be fine. Honestly, I, I've seen a lot of claws. These are probably some of the best ones I've seen. I mean, these look legit. Yeah, they look really cool. Yeah, we did, uh, we've been doing a superhero fight show in the mornings for people waiting in line. Okay. And they brought us in to do that, and so we needed something that would actually withstand the fight choreography and all of that. So, so far, so far they've, they've so far they've held together. Yeah. Well, you guys look great. So, thank you guys for coming out and enjoy the rest of Kamikaze. Yeah, you too. How do I get? Who, who else? Who else we got? How are we doing, guys? We surviving? Holy cow! There are a lot of people here. It is amazing. This is probably. Let's see if we can find anybody else. Uh, Assassin's Creed. Whoa. Oh my goodness! What's up, man? What's going on? How you doing? Good. You look pretty good. This is uh, this is some serious hardware you got. You you like you have as many guns as I think the video game actually has. I'm trying to be screen accurate. Screen accurate. Okay, so so tell me a little bit about putting this together. How much of it you made? How much of it you bought? What made you decide you want? Are you, do you play Assassin's Creed? I do play Assassin's Creed. The guns were bought for right now. The wrist weapons were bought. Well, hey, show, show the camera your, your Victims, victims, victims. Who wants to be the next victim? Whoa, small children. Hero children. So Riddler, you want to come over and show us your costume real quick? That's all right. Oh, come on. You're in mass. No one knows who you are. All right. Oh, we got some, some tough cells. Oh, let's see. If it's going to fit if you're buying it online. Uh, I read the description. It's the best bet. You read the description. You hear that? Reading the description. As a man, as a man, we don't always read the descriptions. I don't read the directions, but clearly, I guess when you read the directions, you get something that fits pretty well. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
So, so of all the superheroes, is 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 Batman your favorite? Oh, of course, hands down. Okay, all right, and and but you realize though that that com that Stan Lee is a Marvel comic. Of course, that's why so, I'm here to represent DC. You're here to represent DC. So let me ask you this. So if you were had to choose a Marvel character that you liked, who would you who would be your favorite Marvel character? Captain America. Captain America. Captain America seems to be a pretty popular guy. You gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me, really? Well he, I've seen a lot of Captain Americas. I haven't seen too many Batmans as good as you look, but um seen a lot of Captain Americas. It takes time, dedication. Well, thank you very much, Batman. I hope you have a wonderful Comic-Con. You too. Take it easy. Kamikaze. Wow. I don't even know where I am anymore. Hard to find? That are hard to find. Inside so here is his second mask. Ben, can we see his second mask here? Oh, wait, yeah, quick costume change. Costume change. <laughs> oh, nice. Interesting. So this is mask number two. Yes. Oh, yeah, check this out. No problem. So what makes that change? Um, it's a heat sensitive pigment that is applied to uh, uh, fabric acry uh, acry acrylic fabric paint. And um, it's very, very nice on my face. It's, it doesn't get too hot. And um, it, it, you can't see me and it, it feels good. That's awesome. Well, yeah. what, what's your actual name, man? My name is Deontay. Deontay, nice to meet you. Nice I'm to meet Andy. you too. Thanks for stopping I by appreciate Sam it. Wilson. Yeah, Have man. a great day. You, you too. Hey, what's up, Joker? How are you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good today. How are you? Good, good, good. So, tell me about your costume. Uh, it was about Halloween time when I had a lady friend of mine who wanted me to be her Mr. J, so I decided to pick up a costume and then make all this makeup. Cool, cool. So, what, ki what kind of makeup? What is that exactly? Uh, my first attempt was with acrylic paints, but that obviously chipped off. So, I had some leftover liquid latex, I applied it all around my face, and then added a very light layer of uh, paints on it. And for the little marks and even the uh, shadings up here is some black paint, and a little bit of blood to make. Yeah, I see that on the lips there. That's it. And where did you get the coat? That doesn't seem like something you can get just anywhere. Uh, I bought it online. It was probably about 100 pence fabric. Uh, so, like, how much did this cost total? Uh, total, I, I bought some wrong things, so total is probably about 150 dollars. Okay, not bad at all. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Now, does this this is blown up a little bit? Yeah, there's a, a an undersuit that uh -huh. uh, inflates, so it keeps it keeps the shape going, and then. Uh, covered with the fabric to give it the, the look. And then is there a fan that's inside of it that puffs it up as well? Exactly, that's what's pulling air in to keep the uh, keep the shape going. <laughs> that's awesome. And then did I see you had a, a Pokemon master behind you too? Yeah, that's my trainer. Oh, uh, you have a trainer. Ah, oh, he's over there texting. Uh, he neglects me. <laughs> oh, he neglects you, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> that's awesome, man, that's awesome. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm glad to see you. It's more relaxed. What's your name, by the way? Uh, Julian. Julian. <laughs> yeah. Nice to meet you, Julian. <laughs> yeah. Hi, guys. How's it going? Good, good. Oh, do you want to do a quick interview? Tell me about your costume. So it appears that we have a Jedi here. What is your Jedi name, by the way? Jedi Casey. Casey. Ah, Casey, say hi to everybody. We're hi. doing some what's live up? webcasting. Hey, what's up? So, where did you get your costume? Spirit. Spirit. That's cool, man. What's your name, by the way? Casey. Casey, how's it going? That's going alright, man. Good, good. Now, Casey, where did you put? Did you buy this yourself, or did you put it together? No, actually, I did buy it. Someone made it, though. Oh, really? Uh, who made it for you? Uh, someone on eBay. <laughs> someone on eBay? Yeah, I just bought it because they had it already. Oh, wow. That's awesome, man. I thought it was cool, so... So... Oh, you got wings, too? Cool. That's... I have to fix them, but... <laughs> oh.
<laughs> well, say hi to everybody. All of our fans are watching us right now. Yeah, how's, they're it going? how's it going, Pokemon yeah. World? <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah, we just had a Snorlax and now a Charizard. Yeah, I just had a fat picture with him. That's sick, oh, man. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks for stopping by. Oh, nice there you are. <laughs> yeah, man. So where do I check you guys out at? Uh, Stan Winston School is online. Well, go to stanwinstonschool.com okay. and check out our episodes. And we have lessons on how to create all of these fascinating uh, memorabilia from films. Everything from predator mask painting to uh, creating dinosaurs. Nice. You might like that. We do yeah, that out cool. of foam fabrication like you see the one up there. Yeah, I do. Yeah, all pretty right. awesome. Thank you. Have a good one, man. Thank you for stopping by. Welcome. Man, yeah, well, you nice take it easy. Take nice care, meeting guys. you. Yeah. What's up guys, come on in, take his pictures as close as you want, hop in there. One, two. Sorry, buddy.
that scary. Yeah, he's scary. Oh, bro, he's scary. Toodles. Testing, testing. Does that sound good? All right. Am I wearing this thing right? Look good? Yeah, sure. How's it going, guys? All right. Uh, like you said, I'm going to do a little pain demo. Um, if you guys go over to the Legacy booth, you can see a lot of the stuff that we've uh, done and worked on. Um, I've worked on all the Iron Man movies, helped paint Iron Man since the first one, including the Avengers and, and um, tons and tons of other stuff. Um, it's almost embarrassing to say because people don't believe me. Too, mu too much. But uh, what I'm going to do today is just a little quick demo. We're here for like two hours, so I'll get as much as I can done. Uh, I'm going to paint a little fish man that uh, my good buddy John Sharevka, one of uh, my, uh, uh, my partners in painting, uh, he, he sculpted this guy, so I wanted to represent him as well. Um, so the best thing to do is just get started, and that's what we're going to do right now. Um, I'm going to start out with a Tamiya paint, which is a, um, an acrylic alcohol-based paint. Uh, thins down with uh, either the Tamiya thinner or denatured alcohol. One thing you want to make sure you do is when you open it up, you can shake it for half an hour and it still doesn't mix up, but make sure you, you go in there with a little stir stick and uh, get all the pigment stirred in there and get the color to the maximum potential. So like I said, I'm going to start out with a little fleshy color on, a, on the uh, front of them. Maybe I'll put a little touch of blue in there just to make it not so humanoid. Kind of like a greeny olive color. How you doing, man? This is my buddy John Sharevka, who sculpted this thing. He's a fantastic painter, sculptor, artist in general, and uh, a man that I've been in the trenches with many a times, uh, duking it out with deadlines that seem impossible, but we managed to do it. Um, you want to show your face? <laughs> Everybody. Here today. Got a master painter at work. <laughs> master what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna throw a little bit of color just kind of randomly throughout it, just so we have a uh, not so uniform kind of uh, look to it. What I kind of omit as much as. Test, test, test. Can you guys hear me? 
I'm going to interrupt you for a second, Jamie, to say how amazing you are. Uh, welcome to the Stan Winston School Booth here at Kamikaze. Who loves Kamikaze? Who needs Comic-Con? Come on. <laughs> And it's nice, I live in LA, we can all go home after this. Uh, Jamie Grove, uh, this man is one of the premier artists in creature effects and character creation. He is the man who, when it's time to paint an Iron Man suit, this is the guy who does it. Uh, when it's time to uh, paint an Iron Monger, call Jamie. When it's time to paint a zombie or an alien or anything else, this man is one of the tox with aspiring students around the world using the internet as our medium for education. Uh, we have a massive library of tutorials from the very best in the business on everything from design to sculpture to puppetry to mold making, lab work, digital work, and it's all being taught by the best in the business and we're online. So stanwinstonschool.com, just log in, you can start learning from the best. Um, and without further ado, I'll let you guys learn a little bit from this guy. Jamie Grove, one of Hollywood's great painters. One more time for Jamie. Yeah! <laughs> yeah. Well, now that I'm embarrassed, thanks. Um, we'll continue. Yes, <laughs> uh, so we'll start putting a, a second color on here. Let's try to get some kind of a pattern going on here that I can work with. Again, just freestyle kind of paint and having fun with it and not being afraid to dig in and have a good time. I'm gonna just start rolling this color into the front. I don't even know, maybe like 15. Um, if I'm running silicone or rubber cement, it usually goes higher, I would say 30 to 40. Um, well, uh, acrylic-wise, yeah, if you, if, you, if you blow it too fast out of your nozzle, it'll tend to dry and create like this weird cone crust shape and it kind of gets in the way while you're painting. Sometimes if you press your trigger again, you'll get a blob of that. It'll come out and go blop right on top of your, so, which is kind of a pain in the butt to clean off. So the lower the pressure on, and also I don't want to fog up the place with tons of fumes and stuff like that, but for, you know, just, a, just painting in your garage is kind of better to use. Yeah, it's a little bit more controlled too, you know. superhero movies and being a superhero fan myself it's always rad to see what what's gonna go on you know for worked on Thor when I saw Thor it's like sweet he looks great man you know and uh, you know you, we put on the suits for Iron Man and to be a part of that was great and uh, put on the suit for Spider-Man was was a blast and it, it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun to be a part of that you know because like I said, being a fan, when I was a kid, this was, I'd sit in my room for hours and read comics and now to actually be, bring it, help bring it to life and to be a big part of it is uh, pretty rewarding. And it's something that'll live on forever too, you know, it'll, you know, my name will be in the credits forever. Make up of some fleshy areas and help bring it to life.
All right. I think now we could probably start doing a little bit of spattery to help break it up and give it a more of a fleshy tone. And all we're going to do to mix up the paint for that is we're going to thin it down just a little bit more than we would normally. If I can get this color open. And then um, going in. But uh, other materials too, like when we paint silicone or rubber cement, we'll usually pre-mix our tints just to save time and uh, when you get crazy deadlines every minute pretty much helps so again I'm still continuing with the spatter color so Check, 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 check! We got some skills, man. Not audio, but some. Thank you all for putting up with me. I'm inept, but I take good pictures. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna switch out airbrushes and uh, do a little bit more. Okay, <clears throat> like a darker blue in here. We'll start mapping out some cool patterns. This man has uh, worked on uh, so many movies that you know. Just shout out some of the the winners. Um, all the Iron Man. All the Iron Man movies. The Avengers. The Avengers. Uh, Cowboys and Aliens. Cowboys and Aliens. Real Steel. Real Steel. Avatar. Avatar, anyone? Avatar? That one went straight to video. <laughs> but uh, War of the Worlds. Uh, needless to say, this guy's a genius. And today, he's showing you a little bit uh, about how he uh, achieves those magical effects with paint. Um, in effects, you have to be able to uh, turn something into something it's not. You need to be able to take plastic and turn it into metal. You need to be able to take foam. Then it's your job to replicate it about 10 different times, uh, 10, 10 times and uh, make sure it's all consistent and 
but uh, a lot of times we'll get artwork to where we gotta go from and we have a hand of what it's gonna look like and what the studio wants to see. Um, but the fun stuff is when you actually sit in your garage and could really do what you want to and have your artistic skill come out um, the way you want to have it, the way you want to see it, instead of conforming, conforming to somebody else's idea and somebody else's um, And with the uh, dual action airbrush, you, you can get a lot tighter lines and and um, a little bit more control, as opposed to the Pache, where it's a single action, but you can control the, the width of the spray through the uh, front of the nozzle, where this is, uh, the trigger is a dual, so you can, you have the, you have the capability of, sure. Uh, come on up, come on up. What's your name? Travis, why don't you go ahead and ask Jamie, but be loud. All right. Hello, I was actually wondering uh, what would be a good uh, spray gun to use for starting off. Uh, starting off, well, I, I'm still using the same airbrushes that I pretty much started off with. And uh, the reason why I haven't switched them out is because they, they work good. Um, for my boulder stuff and for my, my spattering and for any kind of flesh stuff, I always I use my uh, Pache H, which this is probably about a $40 airbrush. It's pretty cheap. And for my finer stuff, you can see how old this is. I see the chrome worn off on it. But this is a uh, Iwata HPCS, and this is kind of mid-range as far as um, um, how fine of a line you can get, but you can still get a pretty fine line. Um, but then they got the microns and all that. But this is this again is probably like maybe a hundred and twenty dollar airbrush. Between the two of them, you should be able to get what kind of a look you you're looking for, for sure. Yeah, no problem, man. Thanks. What's up, dude? How are you? How's it going? I've worked with Jordy before. A ADI. A couple of times, I think. How are you, man? Does so anybody know Jordy Uchel here? One of the best sculptors around? Artists around, I should say? What's up, dude? How you doing? Good, bro. How are you? <laughs> so, I don't want to so see guys, I'm forcing Jordu to do this because he said, no, 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 Jamie's doing a demo. And he's right. Uh, but while Jordu's here, he's another one of our teachers, brilliant uh, effects uh, artist and creature designer. And this is a recent lesson. He sculpted this and uh, then painted it. This is actually painted clay. He didn't mold it or anything. So. You get a shot of Wally there, a little bit. Um, got some f fun stuff going on around here.
and then from there I'll thin it down some more to get a nice okay. flow that I want. You know, it, it depends on what you're looking for, pretty much. It's kind of what suits your style, what you need. Yeah, that's for, right. for dry brush and stuff like that, and it's a pretty readily available paint, and inexpensive too, which is, which is great. And yeah, I'm sorry? For, what are you, is that what I'm doing now? Right now we're starting to pull out some shapes and different things going on. Again, this is kind of like a freestyle kind of paint. There was no rhyme or reason. It's kind of just natural, you know, um, especially in creatures, robots and stuff like that. It's a whole different story. Um, especially like painting flesh, you know, there's never one color that's flesh color. It's, it's ridiculous, you know, there's to, to paint tons of colors, yeah. yeah. When I paint a silicone head, silicone head I painted over here for one of the videos I did, um, I probably had at least 20 different colors that are in there. And if you look at it close, some of the colors, the colors are so subtle and, you know, just, just having that in there kind of just tricks your eye to make it, make you believe that it's not a paint job and it's more of an organic feel to where, you know, you see that in everyday things. When you look at somebody's face, they don't have just one crazy. That's a guy right here, Jamie Grove. This is the guy who paints the Iron Man suits, uh, along with a couple other painters. And he, he, he's the guy who uh, works on Spider-Man and the Avengers and Pacific Rim, all those pilot suits. This guy painted a lot of those. He is uh, he's one of the best artists in Hollywood. And you are here watching him share some of the techniques that he uses to create your favorite characters for the movies. Um, he's painting this little bust here, but all the techniques he, he's using are, are also used in movies. So if you have questions, if you're a cosplayer, if you like making your own art, uh, this is one of the best in Hollywood. He's here to answer your questions and show you a little bit about what he does. And again, Jamie Grove paints Iron Man suits that you see in the movies. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> All right, and check it out. He's going to be demoing for a little while, and uh, he's here to answer your questions. Whoa. Oh. Yes. And he painted this. One thing I do.
who is one of the top painters in town. And uh, if you guys have any questions for him about his techniques, just shout him out. Yeah, He's sharing means. the secrets today. All the secrets. Secrets. The secrets. The secrets of life. Any Air cosplayers want to come in here and show us your stuff? Anyone in makeup? No? I'm looking for someone in makeup. Why aren't you dressed up, guys? Uh, you play make-believe all week long. On the weekend, why bother? <laughs> exactly. I can just be me. Yeah, absolutely. He's refurbed it and welded it back together because it's just, uh, it's, it's conformed to my specifications, you know, where a new one just doesn't have the same feel. It's your tool, like it's your instrument. Absolutely, like yeah. Absolutely. It all depends. Like right now, I'm just kind of just winging it. Um, if I had time to sit down and, and think about it, everything would be completely different. But um, I'm just trying to show some different techniques and how fun it can be. And you know, it shouldn't be frustrating. But again, it all comes from imagination and what you want to see. Um, once I have a good picture of you know what I want it to look like, then it's kind of going through the movements and getting the colors right and getting the spatter techniques and all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, I remember when we did Avatar, we did the um, um, Navis, is that what they're called? The blue blue people? Um, I remember some of our designs were so specific and I remember John Rosengrant, my boss, was telling me, he's like, you know what, if we had these exact pictures of what he wanted them to look like, but in the stripes and striations and, and things that it had, but different colors and everything. And um, I was just getting off of Real Steel and um, just finishing up with that and went on to Cowboys and Aliens. I asked Shan, I said, well, let me give a go at it. Let me paint up something. And, and um, I ended up doing a couple of different things on it and where everybody was trying to stick to the design, I kind of went out of the bounds a little bit more, and that was, not to brag or anything, but that was the one that they went for because it wasn't, it was a little bit different. Kind of it was funner, it. yeah, kind exactly. Of kind of, I, I, all I did was, uh, was add more realism to it instead of like a, a hokey, cartoony illustration, you know? Yeah. Too, you know, one of the things that we try to replicate is, uh, you know, just take day-to-day -day things for advice. Or, for example, like if you go look at your car. If your car's dirty, you see that, that residue from the dirt and the rain coming out. And you know, we try to replicate that on something that's going to be in the elements. You know, not in such a pristine paint job. Or, you know, everybody wants something to look cool and really neat and pristine. But to me, that always kind of looks funny. It looks like a new car. You know, it's uh, it's cool if that's what it's for, but. In the real world, you give it a day, it's already weathered. You know, if there's a robot walking around, and within one day, it's going to have scratches all over it. You know, so. And a good thing too about doing stuff like that is when you are on set, um, you already have scratches in there. You'll never notice the new ones either. So. <laughs> or, or just leave it as is. That's it. That's part of the environment. That's what happens to it. Yeah. I got to be honest with you, it's, it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, I've been airbrushing and doing sculptures and stuff since I was about 13 years old. And um, a guy down the street from me, uh, just as much artwork goes into making a sweet horror effect than, than it does, you know, a monster or, a, you know, a robot. Uh, but... Um, it's always good to change it up too. If you if you do too much of one one thing, it it just you kind of get burnt out on it, you know. Um, like if I've been painting robots for the last year, like on an Iron Man movie, and then uh, and then we get a show like Cowboys and Aliens, it's like, oh yeah, this is great, you know. Um, it's always good to change it up. I thoroughly believe that. Um, and same with that uh, at home, too. You know, you don't want to do one kind of thing at home. You know, the cool thing about doing it at home is nobody's there to... Yeah, 
Yeah, I remember when uh, we were doing that. I, I forgot the guy's name that did the Gonzo. We did a Gonzo and a Miss Piggy, but it was great. They pulled out like these old notes that were like handwritten like 35 years ago. It's like, dude, <laughs> we can get these Xerox just so we can have them, you know, without destroying them. But it's pretty. It's I thought it was rad, you know, seeing these old notes that they still use, you know. Yeah. It's awesome. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things too that um, if you have a. Uh, an okay sculpture or a uh, mediocre sculpture, you could really bring it out by doing a good paint job on it and make it look lo a lot higher quality than it than it is. <laughs> totally. Exactly. That's right. That or even if they get confused, they kind of put a blur into it too, you know, where it's like, you don't know quite what you're looking at. And now with the dark colors, all I'm doing is just really going into those deepest spots just to give that illusion that it's going in deeper than it is. Now too with this darkest color that I'm using here, I'm just adding a little bit more stuff to it, stuff that I'm seeing as I'm painting it, painting it kind of adding more bulbousy kind of Sherevka, it's C-H-E 
R. E V K A, right? Yeah. E V K A. John Chapetko. What are you on Instagram? I want to follow the whole Jamie Grove? J S G. What is it? I think it's uh, J S G F X Jamie. Or you just type in my name, Jamie Grove, and it should pop up. On your creatures, it's the same thing he does by day for Hollywood blockbusters, and he's doing it right now in our booth. Uh, he's here to answer your questions. If you're an artist, if you're a cosplayer, if you want to know more about how to paint realistic, cool creatures, Jamie's here to answer your questions, so don't be shy if you have anything you want to know. Absolutely. Put your hands together for Jamie Grove. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Jamie. No problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you could totally change the louder and um, uh, man, these guys like go off on that stuff. It just blows my mind. I'd, and they do it so fast, like how we can do it in 3D. You know, he's with oil paints just doing this insane stuff. But I've never, I would like to one of these days, but if time allows, maybe I will. Oh, thanks, bro. Do you paint, Skull? You work in ILM? Sweet. We're I've worked with those guys a few times. <laughs> Almost on every movie, but cool, man. That's great. You in town for a little bit, or? I gotta be honest with you. Now we get a lot. Of, we get away with a lot more than we ever could before. Where uh, you know, with CG and stuff, wiping off of rods and different stuff like that. Um, stuff where, like back in the day, where you had to be creative to hide stuff under floors and this and that. So it actually was this real moving thing. We can get a lot. We get away, get away with a lot of stuff. You got some guy in a green suit with a rod holding it right in there and they'll just wipe them away later, you know, and, um,
This is just a little spatter to break up what I did. Now I'll take a brush and just do like small details, like paint the eyes and just paint the teeth and maybe a couple of other little lines in there and we'll call it done for a quickie two hour paint job. Other things too that I would do, that I probably will do when I get home is, um, mixed colors, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, a lot of it's just for speed right now. It's only like two hour demo, so, um, but yeah, you, you definitely custom color, mix up your colors. <laughs> to get it what? That was only a couple of colors of that. Most of that stuff is just in case I needed it. I didn't really go into this having an idea of what it was going to look like. It was just kind of showing different techniques and, you know, not being afraid to get in there and paint. Fun enough, right? Yeah. No, he's and thanks so much for coming out. No You're problem. a star. Um, I don't like carrying on the show when Matt's not here. So watch Jamie clean up. Who's coming uh, next? Uh, coming up next tonight? Nobody. Do we have anyone tonight? No. No. Yeah. no but we may bring the interviews. People off the floor again after he's done. But tomorrow we have. Tomorrow we got somebody. Who do we have tomorrow, guys? We have great. Sweat. We have Christopher Swift, Chris Swift another Stan Winston Studio uh, treasure, and also Ageless, Swifty's Badass. Uh, and we have some great stuff from Swifty in our library too, and uh, we cover a lot of the stuff behind the scenes. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel that you're on right now, you can start clicking around and finding all these behind the scenes pieces that come from 35 years of filmmaking with Stan and his, his artists. Jamie appears there as a little boy, and so does Christopher Swift and John Cherepka, Trevor Hensley, um, John Rosengrant, and all the guys, Alan Scott, who were there for a long time too. So uh, thanks again to Jamie. Maybe we'll pan the camera around. We'll just sh show you how many people are here and hanging around. And. Uh,